Hello everyone and welcome back to Reading with Raptors on a, another really lovely Tuesday late morning here on the Twin Cities campus of the University of Minnesota. I am out here outside with one of our resident great horned owls who we call Samantha or Sam for short. Um, she's one of our permanent education birds. So she has lived with us here at the Raptor Center for about 27 years. She is at least 29 years old this year. She was a, a full adult. Uh, we were not really able to determine her age when she was brought in. She was at least two years old. So uh, we don't really know exactly how old she is, but she's one of the older birds who lives with us at the Raptor Center. So we're gonna be out here looking around. She's seeing something up above us and I cannot for the life of me find what she's looking at but I'm sure there are some very high up birds migrating through right now. There's a wonderful breeze coming through, so it's a great day for it. Um, so I see some other kind of things rustling around. So uh, I thought today would be a really fun day. I found this great book, or someone brought in this great book, um, called Pass the Energy, Please, by Barbara Shaw McKinney and illustrated by Chad Wallace. So there's this wonderful great horned owl grabbing onto a snake right on the front. It's a great book about the food web. So that was a great book to read. So we'll get started right away because this one has a lot of information in it. Um, but as always, if you have questions for in the chat, uh, I'll see if I can address them as we go. Otherwise, at the end, we can talk a little bit as well if you have questions. So feel free to put those in the chat. So here's kind of a preface here with this whole page full of different animals on it. We have a fox, we have black vultures, we have a caterpillar down here. Lots of different birds. So it says, food manufacturing starts with a seed and energy waits in a plant to be freed. Like an engine that powers the rest of a train, a plant's the first link in an energy chain. Each creature that feeds on a plant is a link, absorbing energy quick as a wink. If that feeder itself becomes someone's next meal, it lengthens the chain like a new link of steel. And so there's a pattern of energy past, a food chain has formed, first hitched to last. Each living thing is a link in the chain with a purpose that nature can always explain. So here are these different animals here. Like I said on the front, we have some birds, we have a spider, we have a little weasel, we have a beetle and a mushroom, an earthworm. So let's find out more. Link number one, born in the sun. A remarkable thing about the green plant, it makes its own food, whereas animals can't. Mixing carbon dioxide, water, and sun, Mother Nature has photosynthesis fun. A sugary food, homemade in the leaf, travels through stems, bringing relief. This energy needed to blossom and grow is shared by new shoots and roots down below. When roots reach for water, there's magic, osmosis. Minerals pass through the roots in small doses. These liquefied vitamins found in Earth's floor make the soil a natural health food store. So here we have this beautiful kind of meadow area. Sorry, I'm blowing around in the wind a little bit. So you can see lots of plants. We have a butterfly and a squirrel here up on a rock. And you can see, whoops, and you can see these roots reaching down into the ground for nutrients and water. So our first link are plants. There's more. It's the same in the sea, in the watery world, where seaweed and kelp grow swirly and curled. Light shining down in merely a glimmer lets plants feed themselves or some fishy swimmer. Quite independent on land or at sea, a green plant produces its own energy. Like a true power plant, the energy is stored. I'll let this truck go by. Like a true power plant, the energy stored, green plants deserve a conservation award. A plant by itself is a link all alone. Its food chain future remains unknown till someone comes by with the greatest of ease and firmly demands, pass the energy, please. So here we see our underwater green plants, our kelp and our seaweeds with fish swimming around. So these are green plants that are photosynthesizing too. 
So what comes next? Chains of Two, the big herbivore crew. The biggest of herbivores top off their chains by eating huge portions of grasses and grains. Buffalo, hippos, and shy manatees are empowered by plants in great quantities. Saved by their size, even plant-eating dinosaurs lived side by side with the meat-eating carnivores. Gorillas love stems and pandas bamboo. The links in their chains add up only to two. Whether leaves, nuts, and honey, or tender young shoots, sweet ripened berries, flowers, or fruits, vegetarian power is equal in strength to the meat found in chains of much longer length. Energy passing from one to another is offered by earth to each animal brother. A chain unbroken along the way links plants and creatures from day to day. So here we have these big grassy kind of plant filled areas with our big herbivores like bison or pandas, really large animals that are eating only other plants. Here's a little bit more detail three in a chain on the African plain. A sea of grass on the African plain provides for great herds with the help of the rain. Grazing in harmony, plenty for all. Plant power makes them grow healthy and tall. But instinct reminds the gazelles and giraffes and rhinos and elephants nursing their calves. Beware of your neighbors, all grazers on guard. Carnivorous cats share your backyard. A streamlined cheetah designed for the chase runs like the wind and s runs like the wind and soon wins his race. A graceful gazelle, nature's gift to the cat, gives the feline a future and he's thankful for that. Passing the energy needed to live is a difficult thing for a creature to give. But a chain unbroken along the way links life on the plain from day to day. So here we have our big kind of African plains. We have these big grassy stretches with some trees around for elephants to eat and gazelles to graze in. And then of course cheetahs to chase down the gazelles. Sorry, these pages are hard to turn. <laughs> A, a chain of four on the meadow floor. A milkweed pod explodes into seed and parachutes down where the meadow mice feed. A nibbling mouse gets his scamper and scurry straight from the seed that he eats in a hurry. But nothing's more tempting than mice on the run to the wrigglers and squigglers who bask in the sun. Snakes relish rodents and often depend on mice for the slither to hunt and defend. So here we have this little meadow mouse eating the little seeds that it's finding, little plants. And waiting right next door is a snake who wants to eat that little mouse. The satisfied snake is bulging with prey, but danger awaits at the end of his day. Nocturnal creatures need energy too, to see in the dark, to do what they do. Alert is the owl who swivels her head when she hears the snake rustle a leaf in his bed. Her wide yellow eyes designed for the night get their glow from the reptile captured in flight. Passing the energy needed to live is a difficult gift for a creature to give, but a chain unbroken along the way links life in the meadow from day to day. So here we have our snake having eaten that mouse, and you can see there's an owl waiting just to the side, and then that owl who caught that snake who had already eaten that mouse, and that mouse had been eating seeds from the plants, you can see how this chain gets very complicated. Arctic five link up to survive. Phytoplankton surf the sea. Their plants adrift with energy. 
too tiny for the eye to see, zillions float invisibly. Now zooplankton, just slightly bigger, gobble them up with ravenous vigor. Power boosted by their prey, zooplankton swim on their way. Unaware that they've been followed, gone in a gulp, their energy swallowed. Like an order to go in an ocean deli, they're ingested or they're digested in an anchovy belly. Eventually, this seafood meal is served to a starving Arctic seal. The energy stored is given away to the dappled seal, all black and gray. So you can see these tiny microscopic, microscopic creatures who have their own little food web get eaten by fish and those fish are eaten by this seal. Very complicated out there in the ocean. And it gets even more complicated. Ooh, very windy right now. A risk for the seal who pays a high price is a bear by a breathing hole found in the ice. Supper will surface for polar bear who waits for the mammal in need of air. She thickens his blubber to wear in a storm and polar bear thanks her for keeping him warm. Fattening up in the Arctic so cold gives chubby young cubs a chance to grow old. Passing the energy needed to live is a difficult gift for a creature to give, but a chain unbroken along the way links life in the Arctic from day to day. So the seal has to come up to breathe in the Arctic ice, and here are a polar bear and maybe some cubs who need to eat that seal as well so they can get the energy that they need to survive those whoo, chilly winters in springs and summers and falls. Woodland mix makes chain of six. So an even more complicated food web here. All right. Goldenrod glowing all mustard and green is a natural magical food machine. When the plant full of chlorophyll captures some sun, energy is born and the food chains begun. Caterpillar looking for a luscious lunch spots the plant with its crispy crunch. When chomping away on his leafy treat, power is passed to his six pairs of feet. To a spider in search of a scrumptious snack, the plump leggy worm is ripe for attack. She spins a silk drag line and drops from a daisy, full from her supper, soon she feels lazy. So here we have a caterpillar chomping down some goldenrod, which at least here in the upper Midwest, we've been seeing a lot of this fall. This is a great time for it. And then a spider swooping down, whoo, a spider swooping down from this plant where it had been camouflaging with its white color, swoops down to grab onto this caterpillar. Then what happens? A warbler waits in the brush on a branch, watching for spider to give her a chance. She swoops on the spider, so thankful indeed, for a heartier meal than a seed from a weed. At the edge of the woods, a weasel is walking, slinking in shadows, he's really out stalking. There's not enough time for the songbird to fly. She gives him swiftness and keenness of eye. Watch out, Mr. Weasel, who lurks at your back. A sly red fox is hot on your track. The weasel is energy just within reach. Her pups share the prey, a portion for each. Passing the energy needed to live is a difficult thing for a creature to give, but a chain unbroken along the way links life in the woodland from day to day. So we had our golden rod, that plant, Eat, being eaten by the caterpillar, and the caterpillar was eaten by the spider, and then the spider was eaten by this warbler, the warbler was eaten by this weasel, and then the weasel was eaten by this red fox. Very complicated food chain. Ooh, and it gets even better. Decomposers on the ground, nutrients go round and round. The animal giants have little to fear, from very few or for very few enemies dare to come near, but even top predators, kings of their chains, feed hungry scavengers with their remains. The vulture is known as a great opportunist that preys on the fallen if finding it soonest. 
An energy source does not go to waste. It's passed to each creature that fights for a taste. Beetles attracted to carcasses and dung quickly bury their treasure. It's food for their young. And maggots from blowflies blow will eat all they can, whereas ants store their hoard till hungry again. Moths feed on hairs and lay eggs on the site. Their larvae won't have to look far for a bite. They'll find enough energy needed to skitter while cleaning up nature's most natural litter. So here we have even our biggest scout or our biggest hunters, our top predators, they still are going to leave carcasses that will decompose and they're helped along the way. So here we have some black vultures feasting on some sort of large, maybe this is the red fox. And here closer up some smaller creatures like beetles and ants and moths, all sorts of small creatures eating on this decomposing animal. No visible signs remain of the beast, but living things wait in the soil to feast. Something called fungus with tangly thread absorbs even more from the flesh of the dead. And millions of microscopic bacteria attack what's left over in Earth's cafeteria. Earthworms then gobble and tunnel below and mix it all up so that new plants can grow. As energy shared by the great and the small, each breakdown releases the best gift of all. To the soil, some nutrients make their escape, and the circle of life takes its wonderful shape. All nature's creatures, linked in some way, are returned to the ground in the form of decay. But their energy lives like souls in the earth that nurture new life and cycle new birth. So here we have this wonderful forest. You can see all of these mushrooms are big fungi. There are lots of tiny fungi that live in the soil too that we can't see without a microscope. But we can often see these big mushrooms that are helping to break down other animals and trees and other plant matter. You can see some deer in the background who rely on the healthy soils that these decomposers create. It's a little bit more. Ecosystems will only survive if balanced food chains keep species alive. Too much of this, too little of that threatens a healthy habitat. We endanger the creatures by taking their space. They can't make their homes in the natural place. Their food sources dwindle, they die of starvation, and food chains are weakened, a bad situation. So here are some various woodland creatures, deer and birds. I see a little rabbit down here and a squirrel. Well, there's a bulldozer out cutting down, helping to move out some trees in the woodlands there. Let's learn from the creatures, the wisest of teachers, who pass their energy one to another, respecting and trusting their planet Earth mother. So here are a group of folks planting new trees, making sure that we have plenty of trees for the future. So that was Pass the Energy, Please, which was, I think, a delightful book about the food web. So learning about just how everything is so interconnected. Great horned owls are a great example. They'll hunt and eat pretty much anything, but all the animals that they're eating are either, are either eating smaller animals themselves, like maybe a snake who had been eating a mouse, and that mouse had been eating seeds from a plant. So they are pretty high up in the food chain, but even great horned owls someday will need to be decomposed out in the wild by, again, things like fungi and bacteria and other small animals. Return all of those nutrients back into the soil to kind of keep cycling back through, which I think is really, really elegant, really fascinating. I did see a couple of questions while I was talking, so I'm gonna scroll back, see if I can find them real quick. But if other people have questions that came up, I think I saw one about pandas. <gasps> yes, so somebody asked, is that right that pandas have specialized diets and only eat bamboo? And are there birds, other than a lot of pet birds that might eat only seeds or pellets, that only eat one or two things in their diet? Yeah, there are, there are a lot of different animals that only eat kind of one very specialized thing. 
we have a lot of animals that are kind of more general, are looking for seeds, or might also eat some insects, or you have, again, great horned owls or other larger raptors who might eat lots of different kinds of animals. But there are also lots of animals who are really, really specialized in hunting one type of animal or one type of food source. So pandas are a great example where they really only eat bamboo, so they can only live in places where there's lots of bamboo. But you can think about how these pandas would have developed that diet, being able to take advantage of such a great, abundant food source when pandas were developing too. I think that's really, really interesting. I'm trying to think of birds. There are lots of birds who are pretty specialized, especially some smaller birds. Um, things like um, different kinds of hummingbirds who are really looking for kind of different types of nectar. There are some where they have very specific beak shapes that really are suitable for just one kind of flower. And that flower really relies on Oh, there's a bald eagle floating up in the sky in the distance. That's what you can see her looking at right now. It's way out there. <laughs> I can barely see it. Um, but yeah, there are lots of birds where they have that very, very specialized um, kind of food finding technique. So again, there's some great hummingbirds and sunbirds that have some very specialized beak shapes just for one particular kind of plant. Um, lots of things like insects. Uh, I was just actually reading more about figs and wasps recently, where there's a particular kind of wasp and a particular kind of fig, kind of vine or tree, and they really rely on each other to be eating the plants and being laying eggs inside of the flowers of the fig to produce the kind of actual fig fruit. Really, really interesting. Lots of very, very specialized animals out there. So definitely something to research into because there are a lot. I can't think of a ton off the top of my head right now, but there are so many animals that are really, really specialized. Uh, just amongst raptors, I will say, peregrine falcons are some of the most specialized. They'll eat a lot of different kinds of birds, but they're really specialized in only kind of diving down and catching other birds. They're not like even other smaller falcons who might also go down onto the ground and grab a mouse or some insects or things like that. So even uh, here at the Raptor Center, we have one kind of specialized kind of bird who only really hunts in one way and trying to catch a couple different birds that way. Somebody was commenting that nature is metal and brutal. I think nature is very, very efficient um, at what it does and being able to kind of recycle everything. I mean, you think of right now we're sitting out in the sun and that's really the one source of energy that most of us are really operating off of is the sun. The sunlight and our green plants, all of the crops and things that we might eat or that are eaten by the other things that we might eat. If you eat meat, then we're eating animals that are eating plants that got their energy ultimately from the sun. So I think it's really cool to think about just there's one really huge source of energy that's shining down on us right now. And then thinking about how that works together with everything else and uh, we have all these kind of nutrients cycling through. Mm, yeah, so somebody was also pointing out um, after the panda question about um, pandas eating bamboo and the very specialized kinds of birds is what worries this person is what if the species kind of what they depend on what happens if it's depleted and that is absolutely a really big concern. We have these different species of animals or whole different families of animals that really adapted to take advantage of one particular resource or one particular tiny area that if we do something to get rid of that resource or we change the environment around it so that that resource doesn't exist anymore, those very specialized animals for whom they specialized at a particular time when there was lots of that resource, now we're getting rid of that resource way too fast for them to adapt to another food source. So that can be really, really dangerous for them and really kind of scary when we're thinking about a lot of these species that are um, endangered or even going extinct. I mean, right now we are in a pretty major extinction event where we're seeing, uh, we're losing species at a rate that we haven't seen before um, since some other really, really big, uh, really big extinction events that we can think of. So really kind of uh, definitely something that uh, us in the environmental community and hopefully all of you at home are thinking about is we have a lot of animals that are really specialized to conditions that we're kind of quickly making not exist anymore. <laughs> so somebody was asking, how can an owl eat a snake? They swallow it whole. So what they'll do is if it's too big to swallow whole, 
they can rip it into pieces. So all raptors, including owls, have excellent curved sharp beaks so they can hold onto the food in their feet and use their curved sharp beaks to tear it into pieces. But I have seen owls swallow whole snakes. <laughs> so they're able to do it um, kind of all in one go. Usually they'll do a little bit of kind of crunching near the head to make sure that it's dead. You don't want to be swallowing a still alive snake. But after that, then yes, they absolutely can swallow it whole. I have seen both great horned owls and barred owls swallow some pretty large snakes, really surprisingly large snakes. Um, but they will also tear things apart if they are too big to swallow whole. But usually snakes um, are kind of narrow enough, at least here in the upper Midwest, we don't see too huge of snakes like you might see in other parts of the world. Um, usually they're kind of narrow enough that they can swallow them whole. They're just very, very long. <laughs> really good question. Um, and then someone else is asking, on a, on a much lighter note, thank you, um, does Sam sploot when she's asleep? And I don't know exactly what you mean, but I have seen some pictures online of various birds kind of laying down almost. Um, and sometimes we'll call it splooting. Um, I always think of like a corgi kind of like laying out with its tummy on the ground and its legs sticking out. Um, so generally this bird uh, does not do that. So usually when she is asleep, um, she's just kind of closed her eyes. She'll occasionally peek out, look around, make sure everything is kind of going okay. I will sometimes see birds um, do what we'll refer to as hawk sitting. Hawk being kind of the bird equivalent of an ankle joint. I'm pointing at my wrist, but ankle. Um, or they'll kind of lean back on their legs. Usually when you're seeing a bird's feet and legs, you're mostly actually seeing their equivalent of their foot bones, kind of our foot bones, but kind of lengthened out into kind of a longer joint. So normally they'll kind of lean back on those and kind of sit on those, kind of similar to how you might see a chicken kind of roosting um, is usually what I'll see. If a bird is very, very comfortable, I'll see them doing that kind of thing where they're kind of hunkered down, kind of with their legs tucked up underneath them. It's probably closest that you'll get to a sploot from this great horned owl. Um, she will on occasion, this particular great horned owl has laid eggs in the past, nothing really in them, kind of like a chicken egg you might get from the store. Um, you know, just a yolk, no, no baby bird in there, but she will sit on those eggs for a few weeks, uh, attempting to incubate them. And so when she's doing that, she'll usually be kind of fully again, kind of hunkered down, kind of like you might be more familiar with like a chicken sitting, um, on kind of like a little egg nest. So you might see that. <laughs> I'm going to see if there are any last questions. These have been wonderful questions, folks. I know this, um, I love talking about the food web and thinking about how everything is so interconnected. That for me is the thing that got me, um, so really interested in kind of biology and ecology. I love the kind of story that's there about how animals kind of adapt and evolve over time of thinking of, you know, how does a great horned owl evolve to kind of take advantage of all the different prey types or how do you end up with a large herbivore that only eats bamboo. How does that happen? What kind of environment needs to be around and the geology of the place and the weather and making all of these big kind of grasses grow into giant bamboo. I just think it's really cool to think about. Um, so with a lot of that comes a lot of thinking about how, what, hap what happens to animals when they are eaten or when they pass away. I always think that that's really interesting. So thank you for joining me on this adventure with Pass the Energy Please and talking about the food web. I think it's just fascinating to think about. Any last questions about our great horned owl or about, I guess, food webs? This is, um, like I said, some really great, um, kind of the, the basis of how we think of a lot of ecology and how we think of a lot of kind of like wildlife management. And we're thinking about all of the kind of endangered species that we have now. Some of the things that we have to think about kind of where they're getting their energy from. We have great horned owls who are having trouble in an area. It's usually not just something happening to the great horned owls. It might be a sign that something is happening to all the animals that they eat or the trees that they rely on. Or maybe it's something is happening to some of the grasses that are making it harder for the mice to survive, which is making it harder for everything else ha uh, to find all of the food. So it can be a very complicated kind of question to think about the food web and how all these animals work together. Oh, yeah, thank you all again for your wonderful questions. I think we'll sign off here just enjoying this great sunlight. You know, this is a very, uh, very light colored owl. So she's probably glowing pretty brightly on your screens right now with the sun, but uh, such a lovely day out. I had to get us outside. So we'll hopefully 
we'll see. Uh, here in Minnesota, the fall is very rapidly oncoming. We lost a bunch of our leaves over the last few days, so the l second half of autumn um, is, is quickly approaching. So we'll see how many more times we can get outside for reading with raptors, um, but we will hopefully see you all next week for more reading with raptors. Um, in the meantime, if you're interested in learning more, definitely keep checking out our website. We're at theraptorcenter.org. Um, you can also keep checking out this Facebook page for more updates on all of our online programs that we're doing, especially as the school year kind of continues to roll through. Um, we have lots of great online program opportunities for you if you have social occasions, business meetings, school things, all sorts of fun occasions to have a raptor visit for and learn some more facts about some birds. So definitely check those out. Otherwise, everyone have a great rest of your day and we'll see you all next week for more Reading with Raptors. Bye everyone.